Good afternoon. Welcome to another NASSP webinar. Our topic for today is bullying, mental health, and student safety, understanding linkages, legal requirements, and best practice. I'm John Norai. I'll be your moderator for today. And I'd like to start by just pointing, pointing out a few technical issues. If you um, have any problems during the webinar, you'll need to call this 800 number. It's in red at the top of your screen, 855-352-9002. And you'll need the webinar ID number, which is also in red at the bottom of your screen, 632-987-643. If you're tweeting today, please use hashtag NASSP webinar. And obviously we'd like to have a, join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash principles. Our, our, excuse me, our website is nassporg slash webinar. And that's where you go to get a certificate of attendance if you'd like to have one when this webinar is over. Um, that address is nassporg slash webinar completed. You'll also be able to go to that site after uh, about 48 hours and the webinar recording as well as the slides will be available to you. And um, without further ado, I'd like to get into today's program. Our presenters are David Nash and George Scott. David is director at the Foundation for Educational Administration, which is the professional development arm of the New Jersey Principals and Superintendents Association. Legal One, which is the group David directs, is an innovative program that provides school law training for school leaders, educators, and other stakeholders. To date, Legal One has provided in-person and online training for leaders. <clears throat> Prior to serving as Legal One director, Mr. Nash served as legal counsel for NJPSA. George Scott, who's also with us, is a family therapist. He practices with his wife, Nancy, at the Center for Counseling Services in Mercer County, New Jersey. In addition, he's a former adjunct instructor in the Counselor Education Department of New Jersey. George is the former director of student services as well as the former coordinator of the traumatic loss in Middlesex and Monmouth counties in New Jersey. He currently continues his work at the TLC as a statewide coordinator through Rutgers UBHC, supporting the work of county coalitions throughout New Jersey. He's a well-known presenter at numerous statewide conferences and professional development programs. With a strong belief in ability, the ability of children and families to heal from emotional hurt, George has focused his work on helping parents, professional educators, and other adults understand their work in that healing. And without further ado, I'd like to turn the control of today's program over to David Nash. David, you should have control of the slides now. Welcome. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you um, and to be partnering uh, with NASSP um, and providing this webinar. We're really excited to have the opportunity to talk about these critical issues. Um, as John mentioned, I am the director of a Legal One program, um, and we provide school law training for educators uh, throughout the uh, state of New Jersey, and we have started providing programs nationally as well uh, for educators, so we're excited about that. Uh, we have extensive offerings, that, uh, both in person and online, um, that are, address a range of school law issues. And I'm thrilled to have George with me. Uh, George is really one of the leading experts in understanding the link uh, between um, social and emotional learning, mental health issues that students may be dealing with, um, and bullying behavior, um, and really trying to look at ways to get to the root causes of understanding children, understanding their experiences, and helping all students realize their full potential. So thanks, as always, George, for uh, joining me today. You're welcome. And let me just add that uh, I appreciate the invitation. It is an important topic, and the folks that are in the audience are critical uh, leadership folks um, throughout um, the educational system to be able to address these issues. So it's a great opportunity for me and uh, to be with you, David, and to, uh, to share the information. So I'd like to jump back in for a moment because I forgot to invite the audience. 
enter their questions in the question box. Um, and uh, George and, and David, when um, when we get to um, uh, the natural place that we talked about stopping for questions, slide 10, if you could point that out because I don't have the slides numbered in front of me, I'd appreciate it. But folks, please feel free to put your questions in the question box at any time and we'll get to them as quickly as we can. Absolutely. Um, so just a, a little preview of what we're going to walk through uh, today. Um, we wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking about what um, we mean when each of us hears the word bullying. And it's an important legal term, and it's a, a legal term that we want to make sure we understand in all its nuance. Uh, we're going to look at addressing student First Amendment rights and balancing the rights of students to say things that sometimes others find offensive uh, with the need to make sure that we're not inappropriately harming other children with our words or actions and making sure we understand when we've crossed that line into behavior that could be bullying or otherwise inappropriate. Uh, we want to make sure that people understand a range of legal requirements that could come into play when you're talking about bullying and mental health. Uh, so we'll talk about requirements under the new federal law, uh, ESSA, under IDEA, under Section 504, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, under Title IX, um, under state law. Uh, we'll also talk about the link between bullying and mental health and understanding some of the research, some of the under, understanding some of the best practices that come with supporting students. Um, and we want to talk about some lessons that can be learned, unfortunately, from some of the horrific incidents that have happened across our, our nation. Um, including um, some school shooting incidents um, and just trying to learn some lessons about how we can do everything possible to support our children and potentially prevent uh, some of these issues in the future. So we did think it was important to begin by just talking about um, a de common definition of bullying. And I do want to stress, um, as we walk through our PowerPoint today, you do have um, access to these slides, so I'm certainly not going to read everything that you have before you. Um, but the U.S. Department of Education uh, has put together a very nice website, uh, stopbullying.gov, and the definition they've included in that website really is a sound research-based definition, um, and within that definition we do see some important concepts. The idea of unwanted aggressive behavior um, and a real or perceived power imbalance. Uh, really the notion of a power imbalance is cr crucial to distinguishing between bullying and traditional student conflict, which certainly is going to happen. Um, traditionally, um, when we have bullying behavior, it's repeated, um, or if it's not repeated, it's probably because it's just started and we were fortunate enough to see the first incident. Um, or it certainly could be repeated over time. Um, and it's important to recognize that if you have two children involved in an incident, one who's the aggressor, one who's the victim, really both need our support. And we never want to lose, um, we never want to lose focus on that. Yeah, I wanted to jump in while that slide is still up there for you folks. If you take a look um, under the imbalance of power to that phrase to control or to harm others, you know, one of the, one of the basic tenets um, that we use in our understanding of behavior is that hurt people hurt people, which then goes and supports what David just said is there are usually two victims here or almost always two victims here. We have a tendency to focus on the bad behavior of the perpetrator, but in terms of healing, in terms of keeping them connected and attached, it's really important for us to understand that something went on and they are hurt as well. Absolutely. So we'll revisit that concept throughout our webinar today. Um, critical for each of you on this uh, uh, webinar today to know your state definition of bullying. Um, our lives might be easier if there was one federal definition of bullying that all of us had to follow, but that's not the reality that we have um, in this nation. Um, every state has its own unique definition. Um, every state has a bullying definition. Every state um, has come to the point where we say that behavior is inappropriate, but there are slight differences within those definitions. So, for example, uh, many states um, require us to, to determine 
what exactly was the motive behind one student's behavior when they singled out another? Was it because of a student's race, ethnicity, gender, disability, sexual orientation, or some other characteristic? But some states do not require that. And it's important for you to know your state definition of bullying and determine whether or not you must figure out the motivating factor in order to determine whether or not something is bullying. And we have included a, a helpful link here. It's embedded where this slide says your state to the U.S. Department of Education website, which actually shows every single state in the nation and gives you information on your state definition of bullying. Um, so electronically, you all have this. Hopefully, uh, each of you has taken time to look at your state definition, but I can't stress enough how important it is because they are, um, in some ways, significantly different from state to state. And for example, every state has its own protocol to follow for how we report issues, how we investigate issues, the specific due process rights that students have. Uh, one hallmark that we do know is true um, across the nation is that students have due process rights. So a student who is accused of engaging in bullying behavior or other misconduct, um, at a minimum, has a right to know what he or she is accused of, has a right to give their side of the story. Um, under federal law, the famous case Goss v. Lopez, goes back over 40 years, makes clear that there's nothing in federal law that requires a parent to be present when students are questioned regarding an alleged bullying incident, um, or for parents to have prior notice before we go ahead and question a student. Um, but your state could potentially have included additional due process protections for students that would require that sort of additional notice to parents. So really critical that you know your state definition on this issue. Uh, student First Amendment rights um, are always an important topic. Uh, many of you might think back to your graduate school days and uh, learning a few Hallmark cases, and one of those is the case of Tinker versus Des Moines. And it was a case that um, involved students who wanted to protest our involvement, and you can sense how long ago the case was because it was protesting our involvement in the Vietnam War. Um, for those of you who vaguely remember that, this might be a, a, a recall session for you, but um, it involved students doing a form of silent protest, uh, wearing black armbands to protest our involvement in the war. Uh, the principal in that case was concerned that this might lead to uh, students being very upset, might lead to uh, folks being offended in school, could cause problems. So the district tried to preemptively stop the demonstration from taking place and preemptively announced a new policy that no protests of any form would be allowed in school. Uh, some students decided to challenge that policy. The case made its way all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court, in a split decision, did say that students have a right to express their views that others may find offensive if they can do so in a way that does not cause substantial disruption in school or interfere with the rights of others. And the court uh, said in that case that students who are being responsible in doing a silent protest, certainly that could be one way to responsibly express your views without causing substantial disruption in school. Um, it's important to note that political speech has the greatest protection uh, when courts are looking at different forms of speech, but even that protection is not unlimited. There are things that we can say that are due that we could argue are political speech that may be infringing on the rights of others. I'll give a simple example. We had a number of instances across the country where large groups of students were chanting uh, something akin to build that wall, build that wall, and directing those comments at uh, particular students uh, within their school. Certainly, uh, one could argue that was a form of political speech Students do have a right to express political views, but it was being done in a way that was considered overly aggressive, targeting individual students, demeaning individual students, and was considered a, a form of substantial disruption and interference with the rights of particular students. Uh, so this was a one spot, John, where we thought we might uh, take a few questions because student First Amendment rights always lend themselves to tough issues about have students gone too far? Thanks, and I, I invite people again to type questions into the question box. At this point, here's one. 
what is the difference between bullying and protected student speech? And what impact does, the, <clears throat> does it have if the speech occurs in school versus out of school versus online? Sounds like three yeah. questions. That's right. There, one, one long question. So um, protected speech really is, um, the, the speech that has the greatest level of protection is speech on social issues, um, on policy issues, on political issues. Um, students can say things that others might be offended by, that might, might be controversial. We cross the line in a few clear spots. The law is not always clear, but there are a few clear lines. So if the speech is happening in school, um, students do not have license to use lewd or vulgar speech. Uh, whether it's happening in school or out of school, they do not have a right to use speech that's considered threatening, that's a credible threat to either another student or an adult in the school environment. Uh, we also have some interesting case law that's emerged that says students do not have the right to use speech that is promoting illegal drug use, or other illegal activity. Uh, there was a famous case, Frederick v. Morse, where students decided to um, unfurl this huge banner at a major event. The Olympic torch was going through a town, and this uh, group of students unfurled a banner that says, Bong Hits for Jesus. And uh, certainly that was a um, major um, concern for the principal who saw that um, huge banner being unfurled case made its way all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, U.S. Supreme Court said, we're not quite sure exactly what the students were trying to say, but it seems like they're promoting illegal drug use, and we're going to give um, school administrators uh, very uh, significant leeway to uh, discipline students if they engage in something that's promoting illegal drug use or other illegal activity. Uh, so it is important to look at whether the words kids are using towards each other are demeaning um, and in many states, if you make comments that are linked to uh, race, ethnicity, gender, disability, sexual orientation under state law, um, you would have significant uh, concerns. And certainly under federal law, if we have something that's targeting a protected characteristic like race or ethnicity or disability, um, we would have something that is crossing a line if it's considered demeaning speech. It does matter if the speech happens in school or outside of school. Unfortunately, we see a growing number of issues where there is cyberbullying that's going on outside of school. Um, if the student's speech is outside of school, you have some additional leeway, but the legal test is still, is this likely to come back into school and cause substantial disruption in school? And kids do not, they're not robots. They don't automatically forget everything that happened before and after school once they enter the schoolhouse gates. So there's a growing body of case law across the country that says school authorities have the right to, to address cyberbullying that's happening outside of school, and a growing body of federal case law that says it does not undermine any rights if we do that. So I think a key test is how are students expressing themselves? Are they addressing a legitimate political debate or are looking to demean individual students? Under federal law, um, it's important that we understand some of the key requirements that we have to keep in mind when it comes to dealing with issues of bullying. So every state now under ESSA um, has to have a plan in place that shows how they're addressing issues of discipline and reducing incidents of bullying and harassment in our schools and how are they acting to improve school climate. There is some grant funding available under the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant Program and some other, a number of other sources of funding to support the work of LEAs or, or local school districts to address the need for a safe and healthy environment. And if I could just add on that slide that, um, and this will come a little bit later in the webinar, is that we want to take another look at what the word discipline is, means, and how it's, uh, in fact, promulgated or used in your school. And the other issue is what does school climate need? We know that there are differences within the school culture, community to community. Sometimes the climate is different classroom to classroom. The real question is whether the culture and the climate in fact incite bad behavior or in fact sabotage good behavior. And we want to be able to take a look at that to see whether or not some adjustments can be made. And that's a, it's a very nuanced question because the school climate has many different factors to it. And 
In some cases, the, the problem, the larger issue we find is the adult to adult school climate. And kids pick up on that very quickly if adults have a hard time working through issues on, uh, on their end. And I just want to add to that, adult to adult can also be the adult in school and the adult out of school, meaning the parents. So that relationship and how those problems are resolved or solved frequently dribbles down to the kids and then, in fact, exacerbates their own behavior or makes it more difficult for them to function. Absolutely. Uh, so some specific requirements under federal law we want to make sure that people um, understand. Um, so when it comes to IDEA and Section 504, students have significant protections in addition to the protections we would have for all students. Uh, we have a number of cases under federal law where bullying has been found to result in a denial of fate. Students no longer receiving a free appropriate public education because of the bullying that he or she is enduring. Um, so that raises critical legal issues. There was guidance from the U.S. Department of Education in 2014, and we've included a link to that guidance uh, for our participants today, uh, that says if a student with a disability is the victim of bullying, you need to convene your IEP team, the team that comes together uh, to develop that IEP for the student, or your 504 team um, in just about every case. So that is important guidance. It came out in 2014. Um, it has not been rescinded. You know, we have a new administration now, but the guidance is still um, in effect. And this guidance is different from the practice in many school districts. The idea is that you convene the full team, including the parent, to determine is there something different we need to do for this student? Was this so traumatic? Was this so emotionally jarring, the bullying that the student experienced, that the strategies that were working before are no longer working? And I'm sure in your experience, George, you've had to deal with students who were really traumatized by going through bullying. Very much so. Uh, by, by the definition, I think, or by the intent of the definition, Students who have an IEP or a 504 plan are more vulnerable in some way, and many times that way is they're unable socially or emotionally to manage themselves or manage the pressure that they get from other students. So the vulnerability, for, fortunately for, for many of those students, they have the additional protection of that uh, 504 plan or the IEP. Another important uh, piece to keep in mind, I find that many principals across the country are not aware of this. but there was guidance from the U.S. Department of Education that came out eight years ago almost, in 2010, reminding school districts across the country, we know you have state laws dealing with bullying, but you also have requirements under federal law if a student is being singled out because of a protected characteristic such as gender or race or ethnicity. And what the U.S. Department of Education said was that we cannot um, forget to involve our affirmative action officer in the bullying investigation process and response. Um, so many districts um, do not think of this when they think about the role of their affirmative action officer or their Title IX officer. They think about that individual dealing with adult-to-adult -adult harassment claims. USDOE is reminding school districts they also have to be involved and in the loop when you're dealing with student issues, where students might have been the victim of sexual harassment or other forms of discrimination. So I would ask you to think about, is this happening? Is our affirmative action officer or Title IX uh, coordinator in the loop and having the opportunity to be part of this process? They should at least be notified. They should at least have the opportunity to give input um, into how we address the behavior and make sure it doesn't continue going forward. David, a couple of interesting questions have just come in, if I could uh, give them to you now. Uh, for, first is, what about the bullies who have an IEP or a 504? Do we convene the team if a student with an IEP or 504 is found guilty of bullying? Yeah, great question. Um, we are required to convene the team if we were looking to have suspensions that go <laughs> beyond 10 school days. Um, now we have to figure out if the behavior is a manifestation of that disability. So at that point, it's a requirement. I do believe it's a best practice for us to convene that team earlier. Why wait until a student has been suspended for 10 days if we are seeing this recurring pattern of behavior? So the federal guidance that I referenced earlier did not um, deal with that issue. 
um, and we don't have any change in federal law, but a best practice would be to convene that team earlier rather than later, we must do it when we get to 10 days of suspension. So I would also suggest that even if the team isn't to, uh, to be early on, that the case manager should be alerted to all of those incidents, because then it becomes the case manager's responsibility to kind of weigh the behavior in light of how the behavior is described in the IEP. Not all bullying behavior for a kid with an IEP is necessarily related to the disability. Absolutely. We have to make those distinctions. And, and the other question that came in is, is really the same question in different wording, asking about um, if, the, if the special needs student is the bully. Um, and so I think you've answered that. Uh, Cassie, you asked that question. If they haven't answered that, please let me know, and we'll go back to your question in a moment. Absolutely. So this is one chart I wanted to include. Um, a few years old, from 2014, um, but the data is still uh, consistent with what we see today. So if you look at this chart developed by the US DOE, um, it really is striking. We see that 51% of our national student population um, happens to be white students. Uh, we see that 16% of our national student population happens to be black or African American students. So, you know, you would expect discipline rates to mirror the population, but that's not what we're seeing. What we're seeing is that African American students are twice as likely to face in-school suspension as their peers. 32% of all of our in-school suspensions involve African American students. And those percentages go up when we're talking about out-of-school suspension or we're talking about extreme steps like expulsion um, or um, long-term suspensions. So I think this is critical. ESSA requires every state and every school district to focus on this issue and to determine if you have disparities like this in your discipline rates, and if possible, what the root causes might be. And there could be, we are all human, we all have unconscious biases. It's possible that sometimes we're not reacting the same way to the behavior of students. And that's a difficult thing to do to, to sort of assess in ourselves, isn't it? It is, and, and it makes me question, and there again, we'll talk about this a little bit later in the, in the program, and that is how is the word discipline interpreted? Is it punitive or is it an opportunity to teach and improve student learning or improve student behavior? The other piece that David was just alluding to is I question in, in my work with, with uh, administrators and my work with teachers whether or not a student's behavior triggers something in the adult that then makes them angry at the student or makes them reactive to the student. And as a result of that, the discipline may be more outrageous or exaggerated than it might if, in fact, the adult can stay connected to the student and really then help in problem solving and changing. So uh, we do encourage folks to consider that. Um, here is a link to the guidance that the department put out in 2014. Um, and within that guidance, the department actually, U.S. Department of Ed, developed a number of scenarios that I think could be helpful to allow you to reflect a little bit on the discipline policies and practices you have in place in your schools um, and to make sure that we are addressing any disparities that we're seeing um, in discipline. You know, even if there are no in, in forms of intentional uh, disparity going on in how we treat students, it's still a problem if we have a much larger than expected percentage of students who are facing discipline. And it's certainly still something that we need to, to look at um, in a constructive way. Another, another question. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I have another question that came in, but I can hold it until you finish. Okay, uh, just a couple slides and uh, then I will turn over, so that might be a good okay. break point. Um, okay. Full of other federal laws to keep in mind, uh, Title IX, includes protections for students who are bullied or sexually harassed due to gender. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act provides very specific protections for students based on mental um, or physical impairments that substantially limit major life activities. So we should never in any way be discriminating against a student because the student might be dealing with mental health issues, or an adult for that matter. Um, here's one case uh, from New Jersey. I happen to, to know the case, the, the New Jersey case, but it um, is looking at and applying federal law. 
here we had a student who was going, uh, student with a disability, and the school district was sending that student and paying tuition for that student to go to a private academy. That's what the IEP called for. Um, student engaged in some behavior that was a violation of the code of conduct. Uh, the district um, was concerned about the student, thought the student could present a danger to himself or others, and made re-entry of the student conditional on a student having a psychiatric evaluation by a district chosen doctor. So the student was not allowed to come back to school. School says, I think you're a danger to yourself or others. Uh, we need you to, to see the psychiatrist first. Parent refused. Student was withdrawn unilaterally from the academy by the school district and placed on home instruction. Um, a new IEP was issued. Uh, the case made its way through our state court um, and a state judge um, determined that this was a violation of federal law. Um, the district had no right to unilaterally change the placement of the student and place the student on home instruction. Uh, the district was ordered to return the student to the private school placement and ordered to pay for compensatory services for the more than 50 days of removal that the student uh, suffered. So we do have cases where school districts have a good faith reason to believe a student might be a danger to himself or others, but there are due process rights that we have to be aware of when those cases occur. Uh, so if you want to have an expedited hearing, I'll go back to that slide. If you want to have an expedited hearing, um, you would have to file under IDEA for that expedited hearing um, in order to keep a student out of school pending a psychi psychiatric examination. So many school districts don't realize that. Our courts will treat that as if it's a day of suspension, um, and we have to make sure that we're following all the due process rights. Uh, a couple uh, questions. Um, I'd just, just like to make a statement before with the questions. Uh, someone uh, entered this a while ago, and I, and I thank her for it. Um, asking us, please, to not refer to students as bullies. Uh, calling students bullies is name calling. It's best to refer to the bullying as behavior. Because we hope to change this behavior, please refer to students students who have engaged in bullying. And I'd like to thank you for that comment and tell you if we uh, any one of us said it correctly, we're, we're sorry for that, and we hope that... Uh, we all agree. We all yeah. agree. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, yeah. I'm glad that, for that comment. Uh, uh, next, next question, I think, is is really very fundamental that we need to get to it. Can you please clarify the part about the student having a 504 or IEP um, as, as a victim? Um, are, you con are you convening the IEP team for what purpose? And... and who must be there if a student on a five, has a 504? So um, the purpose for convening the team is to look at whether a plan that is in place right now is still effective. Um, you might have a student who now isn't ready to learn, a student who has been so traumatized by the bullying that the instructional strategies we used before um, aren't effective any longer, or without additional counseling or some other form of additional support, the student's not able to learn in school. Um, so that's the purpose of that meeting, to assess the impact that the bullying had and whether we need to do some different approach. It does need to include the parent. The parent um, is a member of that team um, and should be present along with the case manager and other staff members who are knowledgeable about that student's disability. And what if you just parent there? Say that again? What if the parent just refuses to be there and refuses to be a part well, of the process? I mean, that does happen. So what districts have to do in cases like that is document the attempt mm -hmm. to have the parent be part of the process. And I would be creative. If the parent can't be there in person, I would offer to have them come in by Skype or just a conference call. So you want to just show that it's on your end, you're doing everything possible. Yeah, thanks. Uh, here's another question. Does Title IX also protect transgender students? Ah, so we have an open legal question on, on that issue, whether Title IX protects transgender students or not. There's conflicting um, legal interpretations of that issue. Um, the prior administration in Washington had put out a guidance document saying it was their belief that it does protect those students. The current administration has rescinded that guidance. There was just a, uh, federal, a lower federal court ruling 
um, saying that Title IX does protect students based on gender identity or expression. So ultimately, I suspect the U.S. Supreme Court will have to answer this question because we're getting conflicting views from some courts across the country um, and from uh, the current administration uh, on that issue. So I wish I had a definitive answer for you. Um, it is critical that you know your state law on that issue. Many, many states have included specific protection for students based on gender identity or expression. It's not clear under federal law, but certainly um, if a student is being bullied, is being harmed, um, there's an excellent likelihood that in some way, shape, or form that student is protected um, under at least your state law. Other, any other questions at this point, John? Not, not right now, thank you. Okay, um, just to switch gears a little bit, uh, we have had some horrific incidents that we have had to deal with uh, across the nation, um, unfortunately. And, you know, so we do see school shootings that have occurred. Uh, without um, getting to the root cause of any one particular incident, it's so difficult, if not impossible, to do that. Um, FBI research, looking at a large number of incidents, uh, tells us that about uh, two-thirds of student shooters uh, were themselves at one point or another victims of bullying behavior. Now, I do want to stress this is not a simple cause and effect relationship. The media will sometimes tend to do that, um, or they'll do that with uh, bullying and suicidal ideation as well. It's simply not that simple. But it is important to recognize that there is some evidence that this is one important factor that could be a final straw for some students with other risk factors. Um, and we do want to think about that. Uh, so there are some red flags that come up when we think about the Parkland shooting and you know, the other recent shootings, uh, one just this past Friday that uh, we're all uh, trying to cope with. Uh, is there a coordinated approach to addressing mental health concerns in our schools and community? Um, we all wish we had more resources that we could devote to this issue but we need to make sure we're doing everything possible to maximize the use of the resources that we have. Do we have an effective system for student risk assessment? Are we able to proactively address, and do we recognize the requirement to proactively address social media posts that are put out there? Um, are we aware of student risk factors? And George will go through the ACES study um, in a moment, um, but the Parkland shooter uh, certainly um, uh, showed some signs of significant risk factors. Um, and how well are we sharing information between schools and law enforcement? These are some really important questions that we should be thinking about in our own communities. Just trying to advance the screen. It doesn't seem they want to, there we go. Some factors, here are some factors to think about in determining the credibility of a threat. So I won't read through those, I do think um, specificity is important and access to means is a very important factor to, to consider. Um, here's a, a useful link um, to an article on knowing the, the warning signs of violence, uh, Dr. Peter Langham. Um, any comment on this, George? Yeah, Peter has done some extensive research across the country uh, with regard to what are the behaviors that we look at that don't necessarily predict but they inform us and they inform our understanding so that we as adults can intervene, whether that's within the school community or to alert our parents in the community so they in fact can intervene in the community or at home. So that's a really important uh, link. Caution, we don't wanna to jump to any conclusions. We don't, it's not predictive of behavior. What it does is it informs us to make good decisions about students and um, behavior that's, that creates either fear or, or potential violence. So we did include that link, which could provide you some really useful information. Before, you, this before, before, you, go, before you go on, I think this question uh, is a is a direct uh, related to the previous comments uh, that George made. Uh, contagion of violence, including suicide, is a known issue. Does it appear that we may be facing school shooter contagion? What might happen next fall with the election dynamics? Yeah, you know, um, certainly we, we, I don't know the research relative to school violence yet. I think that's still being um, assessed, but we do know that contagion is a factor around suicide. Now, it's a factor around suicide for 
other kids who are vulnerable, and that's always the dividing line. Um, suicides don't necessarily have a negative, long-standing, terrible effect on healthy kids, but they do have an effect on kids who are vulnerable, and it can tip them either way in, in considering their own, um, taking their own life. I'm going to imagine, I'm going to extrapolate and say it's very similar to um, school shootings because, like we said before, it's hurt people who hurt people. Healthy kids, even when they hear about it, even when they read about it, even when they see it in a movie, they don't then internalize it and perpetrate that harm on others. So we are looking to be more sensitive to the behaviors of kids that we believe are vulnerable and what is it that we can do to mitigate and minimize the vulnerability? Thank you. Oh, if I can address one more thing, John, because you did mention there's a question there about um, next fall's election. We do know that um, Southern Poverty Law Center, who um, is well established in the country and does the Teaching Tolerance magazine that many of the schools throughout the country use, they did an anecdotal research, not validated. They did it in our last election, national election. And what they did find is, is that the mean rhetoric that kids are either exposed to because they hear it on TV or they're exposed to because they hear it within the adults within their own life circle, home and school, when there is mean, unchecked rhetoric, it does in fact create more stress and more fear among vulnerable populations of kids or it seems to give some of our kids permission to be mean. So does it have? It certainly does. Adult behavior certainly has an effect on kid behavior. So I would say this. I think every principal recognizes this, but it's important for us to, to model civil dialogue, right? It's important for us to show that there are appropriate, responsible ways for adults and kids to disagree with each other in a respectful manner. Um, it's a good thing for students to be talking about political issues, but we need to understand how to do that in an appropriate, constructive way that's not hurtful or demeaning to students. Um, I've mentioned a due process right, so here's a slide that just kind of walks through some due process rights for our students. And I mentioned this earlier, but if you want to remove a student, you suspect the student is a danger to himself or others, um, here is the uh, citation under federal law that requires you to go through an expedited hearing process. And we can't simply have a student sitting at home in limbo for an extended period of time. Uh, there are some unique circumstances that would allow a student to be removed for up to 45 school days. Uh, for example, a student brings a weapon to school, uh, knowingly possesses or uses illegal drugs, or inflicts serious bodily injury on another person. Um, the serious bodily injury standard is very high, uh, so it is not every minor injury. We're talking about, um, you know, a threat of, uh, of death in many cases before we've reached the threshold for serious bodily injury. But if we have those situations, a student could be removed for up to 45 school days, um, even if the behavior was a manifestation of the disability. So with that, let me uh, uh, ask George to, to talk about some of the experiences our students have gone through. Sure. Um, you know, all behavior has purpose. Um, we know that. Um, if you check with the mental health folks in your own school district or you check with the mental health folks, your counselors, your child study team people, they will let you know that we see behavior that we can squelch it if we want, but if we don't use it to understand what might be going on with a particular child, we wind up kind of coming to it late. So this slide will tell you that um, across the country, um, there are almost half of the kids have experienced at least one traumatic event, um, and um, almost a fourth of them will experience two or more traumatic events, but let me unpackage that for a bit. The research says that when bad stuff happens to kids, they're growing up bad stuff. That in and of itself is not a determinant that something that this child will become then to, to uh, promote his own bad behavior or her own bad behavior. What it says is when there is an intervention by caring adults in the lives of children, that it will mitigate the effect of the traumatic experience, or I like, we, we broaden that definition to be toxic experiences. Here's the other factor. We seem to be seeing more and more and more, and I can only speak to here 
on the East Coast where we are, but I got to imagine that's across the country for, for some of you that in fact are in other parts of the country. What we're seeing is more and more our kids have less resiliency and less what we would call distress tolerance. And that in fact could be because we're coming, we're still into this era in which moms and dads or the caring adults are not allowing kids to feel discomfort or they're not allowing kids to feel disappointment or they're not allowing kids to problem solve events that normally make them feel bad for a moment, but they can get over it. And when they get over it, they develop this resiliency. If we intervene every time one of our children has um, a, a difficult, a, a skin knee or um, a, a disappointment in not making a sports team, if we intervene in those, in those times, our kids then never develop the resiliency that they need to be successful. So that's what this is talking about. It's not just the events, it's the absence of the stress tolerance that, that in fact exacerbates the problem. ACEs. Um, this is the Adverse Childhood Experience Study that was uh, done um, back in the 90s. Um, there's more and more attention being given to this as what we understand is, is that in the absence of caring adults or when kids experience significant amount of um, hurtful experiences in their growing up years, and what am I talking about? I'm talking about things like actually the number one is if they're exposed to harsh language and harsh discipline and put downs and criticisms, that has a pr profound deep effect as well as does um, physical abuse, as well as does uh, sexual abuse. We're talking divorces. We're talking um, when, a, when a, a child has a parent who dies and there's not a recovery that's done by other folks. If you will look up the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, there are 10 yes or no questions. The tipping point in the study is four. If you have four or more of them, you are at a greater risk and a greater likelihood of developing both school problems, school failures, problems in your own relationships, and, and uh, problems with adult health. So we want to take a look at ACEs as a way of not predicting, but contributing to our understanding of student behavior. And we have included near the end of the PowerPoint a link um, to additional information about the ACEs study, because it really does provide a powerful lens on understanding our, our children. You know, I, I have to say, other than Kids, for instance, that David has already touched on, kids born with a, a neurological disability, a physical disability, um, kids, most kids, the large majority of kids are built with a system that's pretty intact, a brain and a response system that's pretty healthy. So what happens? Why do 15 to 20 percent of our kids in your schools really struggle with staying within the boundaries of rules? of being able to have good, healthy relationships, of not uh, migrating towards drug and alcohol use to numb the pain. What has gone on? Well, here's some developing human needs. All of us, absolutely all of us, need attachment. We need connection to other healthy adults. And I'm going to expand that a little bit to say this is where I advise um, or suggest that um, school administrators, boards of education, um, uh, superintendents, Take a look at disciplinary practices because if, in fact, kids can get healthier with attachment, then we have to ask ourselves what will happen with punitive discipline like suspensions and expulsions. So if, if it's right, if John Bowlby's work is correct and human beings need attachment and connection, how can we maintain that with healthy adults in a way to mitigate their um, troublesome behavior? They need certainly physical safety, but we're talking about emotional safety. Here we're talking about it. Um, do all kids feel that they belong in a particular school or a particular classroom? Is that classroom a sanctuary where kids can feel safe and that there's a, a healthy adult that has their back? Are the adults in the school able to connect with kids who are out of control or kids who are violating the practices of, this, of behavior, and can they provide soothing and calming behavior in order to keep the kid attached. These practices, which sometimes contribute to the problem and don't mitigate the problem, these developing human needs, I think, should be kept in the forefront of our work with kids. 
this seems like a good time for to me to jump in with these questions. There, there are three or four people who've asked this question in a variety of ways. I, I'm going to lump you together, folks, and if I don't catch the essence of what you're asking, please come back on the question box. The, the question is, is there a research-based assessment tool to use with kids who are suspected of harming themselves or others? I think there are probably, I think you can find, and there again, this is where I would advise the listeners to rely on their mental health people in their school who are particularly tuned into the validated research. ACEs has been validated over time. It can, in fact, be used among adults about kids, among parents about kids, and it can give you an idea that unless we pay particular attention, then this child is more likely with a score of four or more to begin to wander away from healthy, predictable, connected behavior. There's also the Columbia study, the severity. The, the, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, we promote that heavily. Um, it's the CSSRS. Um, there are a variety of versions of, of that. It can be used in schools. It can be used by non-clinical people. If you're worried about a student's behavior of hurting self, and when I say hurting self, really ideating about uh, not self-harm, but, but, but uh, suicide, about dying, the CSSRS is really good at teasing those kids out and getting those kids connected to people who can help. So there are two really good pieces of information, ACEs and the CSSRS, that can be helpful. Thank you. Great. So but let's stay with the bullying. Um, People don't wake up and have a bad day and become a bully. Uh, we begin to see it with our kids, and I know this is a secondary school uh, administrator's population who's predominantly the audience, but this is a good conversation to have with your colleagues down at the elementary and preschool level. We begin to see pushy, aggressive bullying behavior very early on, and it doesn't happen without reason. Bad behavior does not happen without reason. So therefore, if we can stay in the conversation and build relationships with families, if, if we can stay in the conversation and build relationships among the adults in school, we in fact can get at what seems to be the reason why, so, why more and more children are perpetrating hurt and harm on, on other children, or why some adults continue to perpetrate harm on children or other adults. And that phrase, you said it before, hurt people, hurt people, I think is a really powerful way to get that message across. Now, for, for those of you in the audience, that's Sandra Bloom's work. Bloom was the researcher, I believe, out of Drexel in Philadelphia. Her work began in inpatient psychiatric, and she's got a really nice model of building sanctuary that really helps schools and school districts to take a look at the social-emotional learning and how we can make healthy environments. Yeah, this is, a, this is important as insight information. Um, this is Sandra Bloom's work. You'll notice that she's, uh, she's cited at the bottom of this slide. Um, if kids have learned that lashing out protects themselves, then they're going to lash out. It's, we see it as a survival skill. We don't appreciate it as such, and we are both either angry or, or we're concerned about it or we're afraid of it, but that behavior has its origins in safety, and kids will do whatever they need to do when they feel threatened or it's a perceived threat, that they will do whatever they need to do to push people away. Some kids will be aggressive that way and push. Some kids will bolt and they'll leave the school campus or they'll leave the classroom, and some kids will shut down and, and they'll, they'll just be inactive on that. If they've learned to protect themselves by becoming none, that's, none, that's what they're going to do. So understanding what's the the, the preceding behaviors to this behavior helps us to understand better why kids sabotage themselves and how we can join with kids and attach to kids to eliminate that behavior. I'll let this stand as wallpaper of that slide and stand on its own. Toxic school environments. This is not a criticism of who you are or your leadership skills. Only that if there's a way for you and others to step back and identify perhaps where there are areas in the school that are, are more risky for kids 
whether or not there are adults in the school who, because of their own, I'll call it unwellness, perpetrate hurt and harm on others. What we know is, is that many, many times, and this is more bloom work, she is saying that kids in a, in a system cannot be healthy unless the adults in the system are healthy. And fortunately, the majority of the adults are. However, what we're finding in our training here, many of the adults are surprised at their own ACEs score, and what they say is, now I know why I'm reactive. Now I know why I, in fact, and I, I, I am, um, my, my, my response or reactivity to kids is, is not helpful. What can I do for myself that will help me then recreate sanctuary for the students I'm responsible for? And there again, this is more of, of, of the same thing. I'll let this stand on its own merits unless somebody has a question later. This is, this is Maslow, and many of you from your graduate programs will remember Abraham Maslow. And, you know, just very quickly, the top of that hierarchy is where we shoot for. That's mostly where our school goals are for. That's mostly what teachers want. And that is personal growth and, and fulfillment, the self-actualization. But here's what we know now, and the sciences are supporting us. There's no question about this, that... When kids have been subjected to toxic stress and abuse and any a high score on the ACEs, they get stuck at the bottom of this hierarchy and they can't possibly make it. Kids who feel threatened, feel um, disconnected, their prefrontal cortex, the front of their brain that, that is the self-actualization piece, actually goes dim in, when we take a look at it under some... Um, like CAT scans. Um, what we know is, is that you have to have the middle three, safety, attachment connection, that promotes self-esteem. You can't just teach self-esteem as a separated content area. And when those three things of the hierarchy are nurtured and, and reinforced, self-actualization happens. There are things that we know of how student brains and their body systems work when they have been, been um, subjected to high toxic stress. So George has um, included a number of wonderful slides, and I know that we're up against the clock as far as timing. So I will, um, you know, reference those. You do have some great resources that are available to you. Um, we have included a number of great resources, um, and I would encourage you to look at those for additional guidance on understanding childhood experiences. Um, and understanding how to support students. We've also included some basic principles on student discipline that I think are really powerful for us to look at. Um, no drama discipline, I think, is important. Uh, nothing changes if nothing changes, right, George? We have to be open to kind of honestly looking at how we are addressing some of these issues. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the slide? This, this would be my final slide to highlight. Um, we, we, we sometimes get caught up in this issue of discipline and fear and what's going on in the community and school shootings and suicidal behavior and suicide attempts. The science now is, is not disputable. What we know is if we can gently and accurately identify traumatized and highly stressed kids because their brains are not functioning well, there is actually things that we can do as compassionate and caring adults, create environments in which healing happens literally cerebral brain healing and we'll get the behavior that supports the learning that we're, that we're intended to, to, to do in school. We did want to make sure that folks were aware. Uh, many of you were aware a year ago that 13 Reasons Why came out. Uh, it's a Netflix series that dealt with some very, very powerful issues, including suicide, suicidal ideation, uh, mental health, bullying issues, and just a whole range of very difficult topics. Uh, it is back. Season two is now out. Um, all of you should be aware of this. Uh, we included an important article that talked about the impact that the first season had, both positive and negative. Um, there was a significant increase in Google searches for how to commit suicide, how to kill yourself. But there were also increases in students um, doing searches for suicide hotline or suicide prevention. So like it or not, a large number of our students are watching this series, and we need to be aware of that, and we need to understand how to discuss the topic 
and work with our students to make sure they're getting some proper guidance on that issue. Uh, as far as best practices, knowing your data is critical, focusing on social and emotional learning, uh, moving beyond um, suspension as our go-to response to all incidents of bullying, and developing really strong ties. We can't do this alone. We need to work with parents, outside agencies, community organizations. Uh, we have included a couple of resources here for you. I did want to mention Signs Matter Early Detection. Uh, that is something that we put together at Legal One in consultation with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and Rutgers University. And it's a great resource for anybody working in a school to understand what you can do to support our students who may be exhibiting signs of suicidal ideation or dealing with other mental health issues. Uh, we have also put together a curriculum called Stand Up, Say No to Bullying that really is a great resource for um, students and educators. It's a curriculum geared to grades five through nine that provides wonderful strategies for addressing bullying behavior um, in our schools. So with that, any uh, final questions? I know we've, we've come up against our time, John. Yes, you have. but but. Very, very good conversation. Thank you. The uh, questions, uh, I, I think I've summarized them and, and gotten to everybody. I asked a few people one-on-one -on -one if we answered their questions. I haven't gotten answers back yet. Uh, one person asked if uh, I, we could clarify the Columbia instru instrument again, and I answered by saying CSSR, CSSRS. Uh, that's correct. Sure, okay, I want to make sure that's, that correct. that's if they, correct. If they, will, if they Google that or whatever search engine, it'll come up. Yeah, and, and I would like to invite uh, folks online to uh, stay connected to us. Uh, NASSP has a National Principals Conference coming up again this summer, um, July 11th through 13th in Chicago. Uh, you can learn more about the, the conference and actually at, register for it at uh, principals, www.principalsconference.org. Thank you, George. Thank you, David. This has been an excellent uh, webinar. The questions are always... Uh, uh, indicative of of the uh, in, engagement, and I always watch the I mean, who's engaged and kept most of the participants engaged most of the time, and we know they're in school, so there might be a hundred other things pulling at them. I want to thank you again, uh, participants, and remind you, go to the NASSP website, you get a copy of the slides with all the links should be active, and also a recording of this webinar. Thank you for being with us, and with that, I have to say, um, that's the end of today's webinar.